right guys, welcome to another video. And um, well, if you watched the last video, you probably already guessed what this video was gonna be about. It's about uh, making a rear wing for the 55 ASL. Now this rear wing was thanks to Carver Hall Motors in um, Palm Springs, California. They actually pretty much well made this rear wing for me. And Evan, I forgot what his full name was, but I'll um, uh, link it in the description below. He actually did the CFD and everything for this wing and he actually like um, provided amazing results like um, uh, on all the downforce numbers and how the downforce values will change as I um, adjust this wing to different levels. Now the wing isn't fully complete right now, it still needs to be reinforced and stuff. But yeah, I'm gonna start off by showing you guys how we actually made the rear wing and then get into showing you guys all the results behind it, all the CFD and everything. So for making this rear wing, I went to Carvajal Motors, which is a company located in Palm Springs, California. And they have pretty much all the equipment for making custom carbon fiber or fiberglass parts, all the way from CNC machines to different types of carbon fibers. And in fact, their own projects are super cool too. They're working on a super bike as well as a super car. And they're also starting work on a new electric car now. So once I was done with designing the rear wing, I forwarded this exact design to Antonio, who is the owner of Carvajal Motors. He is a car designer himself. And um, he basically took the design from there, reworked it a little bit, and he basically figured out how to make molds and program his CNC machine to actually cut those molds so that uh, this rear wing could be made out of fiberglass. What we did, you know, after looking at his wing, um, we figured out how we're gonna program it and cut it into a CNC machine. So what we did, we took the two foils and then we ended up um, splitting it into separate sections. Um, so we can cut them in the machine and as you can see on this window we have the what it is the foils are split into sections and this is how we're going to cut it into our cnc machine so you're going to be able to see we're going to go down to the machine and start cutting the the pieces next so once all the design work on the computer is complete next we have to go on to the cnc machine this is the thing that's going to actually cut the mold for the um, spoiler or rear wing um, so it's actually, it's M code, right, that um, goes into this machine. And then um, that's basically gonna tell the machine how to cut. So right now, um, the machine had to be aligned to the foam just so that um, this corner is a reference point so that um, basically the real machine is at the same point it should be in the software. And then from here, basically the code is gonna take over and it's gonna cut the whole foam in the same shape. So after letting the CNC machine run for about 10 minutes, I was probably thinking this is gonna be the easiest rear wing to make, but of course things could not have been this easy, and the CNC machine randomly decided to break down and it stopped in the middle. Um, so after that, every time the CNC machine stops, you have to bring it back to the zero position, restart the power, and basically start cutting from scratch again. And after repeating the whole process, bringing the CNC machine back to zero, it stopped again in the middle. And no matter how many attempts we gave it, the CNC machine would just not work. It would trip the circuit breaker, it would lose power. Um, but yeah, it would just not run for more than 10 minutes. To make matters worse, after a few attempts, the machine lost all power and the computer would not even turn on. So even working with a CNC machine was not as easy as it seems. There was a problem in the middle. And after looking into it, I found out that one of the fuses was blown on this power supply. So um, I took everything apart, um, fixed that. Now I have to put everything back together and hope that everything turns on again and it actually works. This one for the computer. Nice. That wasn't happening before. So that's, that's definitely good. Um, yeah, let's, let's hope this actually works. So after fixing the fuse and the power supply of the computer, little did I know that that wasn't the only problem in the CNC machine. So after running it again a few times, the machine would do the same thing. It would cut the foam and then it would stop working in the middle. And it would either trip the circuit breaker or it would trip a magnetic contactor that was giving power to the whole machine. So after that, to figure the issue, I went through all the wiring, making sure there's no short circuits in any of the power supplies and measuring the current levels on these power supplies and also measuring the voltage levels, making sure that the machine was getting stable voltage and everything was fine and the machine was still not working properly. So I decided to put my finger on the magnetic contactor, thinking that that would have been the problem itself if um, that was tripping out for no reason at all. This CNC machine is starting to behave more like the R class, but um, yeah, after a few attempts, what I've done is that I've bypassed the magnetic contactor which is not really a safe thing to do but there is a circuit breaker on this circuit anyway so even if there is an actual short circuit that circuit breaker should trip so it shouldn't be a problem 
I'm actually also talking a bit about the inner workings of the CNC machine while I'm at it over here. It's actually pretty cool. So these are the individual controllers for the servo motors that drive every axis. So three of them for a three axis CNC machine. And um, this is actually the main computer that is controlling everything. So the computer actually has all the G code in it. And this gives um, these things the signal to control the servo motors in a certain way and also to drive the spindle at a certain RPM. And that's how basically uh, um, the three axis move and the whole machine cuts things. So it seems like after all that struggle the CNC machine is finally fixed because now it's been running for like two hours and it hasn't stopped so that's actually really good. Well not for two hours like one and a half hours but this is how far it's gotten right now and yeah it's taken like one and a half hours to get this far so um, this whole piece is probably gonna take like close to 12 hours to complete um, because it's set at a really fine um, quality um, usually when you program these CNC machines, you can also program them to do a coarse cut first and then do the finer cut at the second time, which helps save some time, but um, Antonio said just set it to the final cut first time because it's a really soft material that we're cutting is just foam, so it's faster to do it this way, to just cut it all in one um, go. But just look at the quality of the um, thing it's cutting, like this is a really smooth mold it's cutting out. And yeah, now it's getting pretty late, so what I'm gonna do is that I'm just gonna leave the machine running overnight, and hopefully by the time when we come here tomorrow, uh, we should have a full mold made for the rear wing. Once the CNC machine was done with cutting the molds, it was time to apply the fiberglass around these molds so that the fiberglass could take the shape of these molds. Now usually the way rear wings are made is that they have a foam core inside them and then basically the foam core is wrapped around with carbon fiber to form the final shape of the wing. But the way Antonio decided to do that was that he decided to split each element into two sections like one upper half and one lower half. And then these two sections were basically made separately and then glued together to form the final shape of each element. That's why we were left with uh, four pieces that we had to cut, two for each element. So after a whole lot of cutting and um, grinding and gluing, this is a look at the final um, elements. They have some rough spots on the side, but this can easily be touched up later. Um, this is the upper element, that one was the lower element. And if you look at it from the side now, it's almost a perfect aerofoil shape, just like it was in the design. So that's really cool to see. Um, they're also pretty strong and um, pretty lightweight. So now the last step left is to drill a few holes on the side and add rivet nuts so that these end plates can be mounted on. These are just some uh, end plates that I um, cut off using some aluminum sheet and then drill some holes in it. Once the elements were made, there were these two rivet nuts inserted on both sides to secure the end plates on and this was a process I was definitely not a fan of because I'm pretty sure these rivet nuts are going to fall apart literally um, once the rear wing goes up to a certain speed. But the thing was that by this time we had wasted so much time on fixing the CNC machine and everything that we literally had a few hours left to finish up the rear wing. That's why everything else after this part was super sketchy like uh, mounting the end plates and even the attachment points of the rear wing. But I will end up redoing all this work when I get back to Canada so I will be um, securing this rear wing properly before actually taking it on the track. So here's a look at the final rear wing and um, well it's not complete right now. The elements are complete and the elements are looking pretty okay except for the really horrible paint on it and also like uh, it needs a bit of like uh, well touching up over here. Uh, but the problem right now is that why I'm not driving with the rear wing is that well the supports are pretty weak and I'm pretty sure these supports are going to break if the car goes up to a certain speed. That's why I need to redo all this when I go to Canada and I'm also going to be redoing the end plates because well according to the CFD results first of all I need bigger end plates for them to work properly because there was quite a lot of air that's um, actually going to flow over this and like cause a big uh, wind, wing tip vortex so like um, bigger end plates are definitely going to help and also like all this bolting this is way too weak I'm pretty sure that all this is going to fly off as soon as the car hits a certain speed so um, yeah that's why there is still quite a bit more work to do on the rear wing 
Also going over the CFD results for this rear wing, now big thanks to Evan Maunder for all these results, he is the one that did the CFD for this rear wing. Um, so yeah, I guess basically starting off with showing you guys how, like this is, this picture basically shows if you cut the rear wing in half and you're looking at it from a side view, these are the two elements and this is how the air is going to be flowing um, along the rear wing. And while in this simulation um, the rear wing is at its most aggressive angle, and what's going to happen is that this uh, element over here, I'm planning to make it movable so that I will be able to like um, lift the front part of this element upwards, which is going to open this slot gap. And basically, uh, yeah, that's going to allow me to adjust the downforce. At this highest downforce level, you can see that there's a bit of separation going on over here, um, which is still fine because this is really little. But um, the other thing is that the air, the way it's um, coming at this um, front part of the element, it's actually coming at a sharper angle um, than the front element is pointing at. So ideally, um, for this setting at least, I should be lifting up the whole wing, like pointing it slightly upward so that the air can um, nicely flow along underneath the rear wing. Um, this is still, by the way, the flow underneath the rear wing is still pretty good um, in this CFD. Um, usually what happens is that if you have a rear wing pointing at the wrong angle to which um, the air is coming at it, what can happen is that there's a bit of separation that starts at this leading edge of the wing and that separation can like um, well the air can sep get separated like all the way uh, through the underside of the wing which then basically creates massive turbulence on this part and th the whole underside of the wing is basically then stalled and it doesn't make any downforce um, the top part still makes downforce but the under part doesn't make any downforce so you're basically um, led with the rear wing that makes half the downforce it should be making uh, but yeah in this case um, even though the rear wing um, well in, in this particular CFD is not pointing at the perfectly right angle it's still um, the airflow is still staying attached pretty much all the way underneath the rear wing which is pretty good to see um, and you can also see why it's so important like um, keeping the leading edge of the wing um, nicely rounded it's because um, it's basically yeah, to promote this air to stay attached underneath the wing um, if the front edge is made sharp, then um, yeah, that sharp edge definitely doesn't go too well for flow at the front of the wing. Um, it basically causes the air to separate at the front. You can see the same thing a little better when you look at how um, the velocity of the air is changing as it's traveling along the wing. So this is basically the same like um, looking at the rear wing from the side, but this time the colors actually show the velocity of the air as it travels over the wing. So um, red is when the velocity of the air is the highest and blue is when it's the slowest. And while you can see that um, the air traveling underneath the wing is traveling really quickly and the air over the wing is traveling really slowly and this is basically what causes the pressure drop underneath the wing and um, an increase in pressure over the wing which um, then results in the wing being pushed downwards and that is what makes downforce basically. Um, the other thing you see is that, um, well you can also see this um, bit of separation that is starting like um, right at the end of the wing, like the velocity, the boundary layer is um, really slow. Uh, when you look at how it's moving at the tip of the wing and this is basically where um, air separation starts the boundary layer becomes slower and slower it th loses energy and then finally the air just um, separates from the wing and then well it's called um, the underside of the wing is basically stalled then it doesn't really make any downforce but um, you can see the benefit of this double element design in this case um, the second element what it does is that um, when the first element is yeah, right about to lose um, the airflow attachment. The second element comes in over there and it basically causes this really high speed air to rush in between these two elements. And what this high speed air does is that it also like catches all this slow moving air and basically forces it to follow along the wing. And you can, you can see that effect kind of over here um, where this fast moving air kind of like um, makes this air stick along the wing for much longer than it would have stuck along if this was a single element wing. And um, then finally the air still separates over here, but um, it's still way better than uh, what this wing would have been if this was a single element wing. Uh, with a single element wing, an angle this sharp would definitely not have worked. You would have ended up with a massive amount of separation over here, and therefore yeah, the wing would not have been too efficient that way. Another really cool thing to see is this graphic that he sent me. This is for uh, the mounting points of the wing. So the mounting points, uh, what usually happens is that um, the airflow behind the mounting points separates really easy from the wing because um, the uh, mounting points cause a lot of turbulence and like they cause they lead to a lot of slow moving air right behind the mounting points. Now this is a bit of an extreme example because the mounting points are um, really wide, whereas in reality they're usually not this wide. But um, yeah, it still shows how like um, this tiny bit of um, separation they cause um, behind this wing, like it kind of um, escalates and it becomes much larger as um, it goes back on the wing. And this also depends on which way the air is coming like at the car. Like if the car is, let's say, drifting through a corner and the air is 
um, heading at an angle, then this effect is much worse because then the air is coming sideways at these um, mounting points. But usually, um, at high speed at least, where this rear wing is going to be working at, the car usually isn't at such a sharp angle. Like even when you're taking a corner at 200 kilometers per hour, um, your car is not going to be at such a sharp angle. Air usually comes in at a pretty straight angle. And you can also see the benefits of the double element design again because um, all the separation that these um, mounting points cause um, it's only till the front first element where the second element comes in and it starts um, sending in all this fast moving air. Um, you can see that that um, separation pretty much has no effect at all at the second element because um, the air just reattaches itself once um, once all this fast moving air comes in from this element. Um, so yeah, that's um, pretty cool to see. Here's a look at the wing tip vortex that um, forms because of um, high pressure air on top of the wing and then the low pressure at the bottom of the wing. Now, the whole point of these end plates over here is to block off the high pressure air that is on top of the wing um, to escape from the side and make its way underneath the wing, which is what happens if you don't have any end plates at all. But um, even after having end plates, what happens is that the air still tries to like um, go all the way over the end plate and make its way around the end plate and that's what basically causes this vortex. Now this end plate design is the one that um, Evan modified and he basically suggested putting much bigger end plates at the end of this wing and also like he angled the end plates um, higher from the back and this um, will dramatically reduce the wingtip vortex. Um, so now there's not too much air spilling over the wing and um, making its way underneath the wing. So for the final end plate design, I'm definitely going to be taking some cues from this and um, yeah, basically going according to that. And I'm also planning to make the final end plates out of carbon fiber rather than aluminum, uh, what they are right now. Another really cool thing he sent me was these graphics of um, how the drag and downforce would basically change as uh, the top element is changed because uh, the top element, like I mentioned, I want to keep it adjustable. So you can see that um, the drag um, goes up massively when the wing is at its more, most aggressive angle and the drag like comes down quite significantly as the angle is reduced even just by 15 degrees, like um, it comes down by quite a bit. And this is a graph showing downforce versus um, the angle of the top element. So you can see that when it's at its most aggressive angle, it's making quite a lot more downforce. And then if you set it just 15 degrees less, the downforce falls down quite dramatically. And here's how the lift to drag ratio will change as the top element is adjusted. So this is basically if you divide lift by drag, or sorry, downforce by a drag, which would be more accurate in this case because it's not making lift, it's actually making downforce. But um, yeah, you can see that um, the wing actually gains more and more efficiency as it's um, uh, as the angle decreases. But then again, it's also making less downforce. So there is a certain point you have to find where um, you're happy with the downforce and um, still it's less enough drag. But I don't think drag will be too big of a problem because um, if you look at this um, lift to drag ratio, like um, let's say even at its most aggressive setting, it's at like 7 point something, 7.5 let's just say. Um, that means that the wing is making 7.5 times more downforce than it is drag. So that's actually still a really good efficiency for the wing. It's not making too much drag, but it's making quite a lot more downforce. Um, and the final numbers for this wing, by the way, were it's going to make um, 420 kilograms of downforce at 216 kilometers per hour. Of course, when I actually like um, drive this car with this rear wing on the track, that's when I'll actually find out what angle um, on the rear wing works the best. But um, I think it's a pretty decent sized rear wing for this car. It will nicely um, counter the downforce at the front so that the car can achieve a nice um, front to rear downforce. Also talking about some of the other things that I did since the previous video, now um, after California I made my way to Texas where I met up with Neil from BXR Motors. He, um, Neil, I mentioned him in a previous video but um, he's basically another guy that built his own car. He built a 1400 horsepower car that he took to SEMA and it was also a street legal car that he was planning to put into production. Um, I will have a whole video coming on his car pretty soon. But yeah, I met up with him and we went to a local racetrack which um, is called the Motorswood Ranch. It was a private racetrack which, um, and some of the really cool things that we saw over there was the, there were these Mazda Formula cars over there and they were actually being built there and the people were really nice so they actually um, let us see all the cars um, being built and like um, take all the pictures and see all the details behind the cars and some of the really fascinating things I found about these cars was that there was literally nothing no extra weight left to spare on these cars um, I was looking at the suspension and the lower control arm ball joints on these cars was literally M8 the size of them was um, M8 just to put that into perspective my lower control arm ball joints are M12 um, so these were a good two sizes smaller, a full four millimeters smaller. Now of course it's a lighter car too, it probably weighs half as much as my car, but that just shows how far these people go to literally optimize every single last component to the limit. 
But after that, the even cooler thing was that there was this Grand Nam car racing around the track and we met up with these people and they were super nice people. Now usually racing teams or people with race cars, they don't even let you touch their race cars. But these people were so nice, they even took the bodywork off, they even let me sit, sit inside the car and um, showed me literally all the components, answered every single question that I asked them. So that was a really good opportunity to get like up close to a race car, see how things were done. Um, professionally on their car and um, also like compare some of the things that I've done and um, how they were doing them and some of the really cool things I found about this car was well one thing was the anti-roll bar setup it had these blade type anti-roll bars where these um, blades basically turn and um, that adjusts like um, how much the anti-roll bar flexes which is pretty common to see on race cars but the cool thing about this one was that there were actually linkages going from these um, anti-roll bars all the way to inside the car so the driver could actually change anti-roll bar settings while still driving the car. So the driver could change between understeer or oversteer while still like um, doing laps around the track. The other really cool thing to see was how small the cooling passages were for this car. Now this was a 500 horsepower car and um, if you look at the cooling, uh, the engine cooling at the front of the car, it's just this little tiny square part at the front of the car that's um, sucking in all the air that is being used to cool the main radiator. And um, yeah, literally that's all the car needs to keep itself cool. The basic layout of the suspension and um, well, some of the angles that were obvious to see, they were pretty similar to uh, my car, like the way I was doing things, but um, I think the biggest difference to notice was how good the quality was of everything. Like billet aluminum machined um, cantilevers for the pushrod suspension, and um, yeah, basically every single component was made to such high quality, and like um, it was, yeah, it was just amazing to see everything. So that's going to be everything for this video. The next video coming up is going to be about Neil's car and everything that he's building in his garage. Um, so yeah, that's everything for now. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one.